I'm going to keep the first part short. If y'all think that um, this Olympic ceremony was the first time they've done anything, y'all haven't been paying attention. And you need to understand that the Olympics have nothing to do with athletics. It's for, 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 for a long time. It's been about a, a globalist, one world government mindset. And what they did in the open ceremony, and uh, you need to understand this, it's an in your face, we're gonna do what we're gonna do and we could care less what you think. And that's what the globalists of this world, so that's where they are because they're the children of Satan. And, the, and they're going to do what they're going to do. So, anyway, that being said, in just a few moments, I'm going to have you turn to the book of Luke. We, uh, we live in a day where if you don't like something, you just protest it. And you just gather up a bunch of folks and you, you say, well, we don't believe this and we don't believe that. I mean, you, you don't even have to believe that you're a boy or a girl anymore. But uh, you can just say, well, I don't believe this and I don't believe that. And, and, and depending on how much noise that you're able to make, it just kind of goes away. Or the way people, that's kind of the mindset, but it's not true. And I want to talk about something today that is under much attack and people want it to go away. But God declares it to be so, and it's not going to go away. That's right. Now, I want to talk about hell today. Amen. There's a lot of preachers that won't preach on hell anymore. Um, I, uh, you know, hear about this all the time, you, you know, this, that, and other. Well, you don't want to upset nobody. Um, I had a lady come to me a few years ago when I was in Arkansas. And she said, you know what, we, we, we would just rather, she was kind of the, the mother hen of the church. She said, we would just kind of rather you not talk about those kind of things because our visitors are uncomfortable. Don't everybody hear me. Listen carefully. What about some? We gather in God's house to worship Him. Amen. We do not structure our service to make lost people comfortable. You hear me? And we never will. You say, that was a long time. Well, I'm planning on being here until God comes and gets them out of here. So, there you are. Luke chapter 16. I am going to, to, to go through this passage and with, 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 without... We, we could be here, you know, quite some time, but there's just, there's just two or three things here that I want us to see today. It's crucially important for every single soul in this room. Familiar passage. Probably all of you have, have read it yourself. Some of you here, some of our teachers certainly have, have taught from this, through this, different parts of this. But one of the reasons that I wanted to look at this passage specifically is because it's just taught by Christ himself. Amen. Do you know that Christ taught more on hell than any other subject? Let that sink in. More on hell than any other subject. Now I'm fixing to say something that sounds so elementary that some of you might wonder why in the world are I even bringing this up. But I'm bringing this up because this is very common in a response, okay? And I'm hearing this more and more over the past several years, okay? And it's in response to one word, it's the word saved, okay? okay? Now, if you'll remember, now I'm the one really to be telling you all this, but if you will remember your school days in learning English, You will remember your tenses. Amen? There was what? There was past tense. Means it's done happen. Can I get an amen? There's present tense. Means now. And then there's what? Future tense. Good job. Amen. <laughs> what that meant was is so far so good, you better be careful from here on out. 
The word saved is in the what? Past tense. You say, well, what's the elementary part? Well, the elementary part is this. That means it's done happen, but also you're saved from something. You hear what I just said? Saved from something. And what's disturbing about this is, is the number of people that I run across, that you may not, but, but I do. I run across people from time to time, whether, whether it be in this area, whether it be in Arkansas, whether it be in Walmart, it don't matter where, but I run into people, this and other, that tell me this. They say, well, I got saved at one point, this and another, but I didn't, get, I didn't know I was getting saved from hell. Can I tell you, if you didn't know you was getting saved from hell, you didn't get saved? Now, what I just said will make some people fight mad. The folks have been getting more funny. Repentance is the act of turning away from who we were by His power and by His strength. God's the one that does the cleaning, God's the one that does the changing, God's the one that makes us new on the inside. Luke chapter 16. Whether it's a parable or a historical narrative, whatever, it doesn't really, that's not really important. It is the only parable where it names for you. Luke chapter 16, verse number 19 says, There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of souls. Now, Y'all don't know how hard it is for me to not dig into something because we just, you know. English words, once again, do not express the full meaning of the Greek. Okay. This word laid, we get the idea that these guys, whoever they are, they wanted to get him some help, just kind of took him someplace and just kind of gently laid him down because it might be, that's not what the word means. It means literally thrown thrown aside as you would do garbage. Gate here, again, we, we're familiar with gate. We're going to um, see, see, see that passage develop, in, at least the word gate, in, in tonight's study. We start the book of Ruth tonight. Five o'clock, be here. Okay? But the word gate here speaks of a extensive gate. We've already seen that this individual who's unnamed is a very very, very rich individual. We need to understand something as we go through this passage, and then certainly they're both going to die here shortly in the passage. One's going, to, one's going to go to hell. We need to understand something. He's not in hell because he's rich. Right. You hear me? Okay. He's not in hell because he's rich. Abraham, which will be mentioned here in just a few moments, back in the book of Genesis, in the Old Testament period was one of the richest men that lived throughout all the Old Testament. He ain't in hell. Heaven, hell has nothing to do with your bank account. has to do with your heart. Who you look to, where your faith is at. Picking up a reading here. Gate full of sores, by the way. It don't mean that there was a scab here, there, and yonder. This is actually pus oozing sores. And desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table, more of the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that if the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom, the rich man also died and was buried. And in hell, he lift up his eyes, being in torments. We'll get to this in a minute. And see if Abraham afar off. Now, I want, to, I want to bring us to the moment here. As Christ is speaking at this point, this is before Christ dies on the cross. I think we all understand that. Not only is this before he dies on the cross, it's before his burial. But in reference to what we're about to see here, this is also before his resurrection. Amen. Now, I'm going to have you turn in your Bible. Just, just keep your bulletin there. 
Turn in your Bible. We'll, we'll be there in just a moment. But turn there to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. It's important that you understand that you see this. So you can kind of get a picture here of what's going on. Now, to start this off, you will remember that when Christ was hanging on the cross between the two what? Thieves. One of those thieves, by faith, turned to Christ. Amen? And do you remember what Christ said to that thief before his death? He said what? This day, thou shalt be with me where? In paradise. In paradise. Now, that brings us to this passage of scripture. Something that we need to understand. Okay? Before the resurrection of Christ, and we'll start right there. Okay? For those of you who take our FBI class, by the way, you've been taught this before by John James. If you had an FBI class, you need to make a point today. Faith Bible Institute, by the way. Before the resurrection of Christ, every person, which we're talking about Old Testament saints, all people that died went to the same place, asterisk. You hear what I'm saying? They went to what, what is known as, you have, you have the Old Testament old term there, um, it's, it's, it's Sheol, it's a boat for the dead. In the Greek, it's Hades. It's still abode for the dead. But there were two compartments. Two compartments. All right? You had the saints, the Old Testament saints, in one compartment. You had this unnamed rich man that's in hell, along with everybody else at that time. Who was the first one there, by the way? Cain. Don't remember? Cain was the first one there. But this is where they are. So you got a compartment over here and a compartment over there. You say, well, what in the world has this got to do with 1 Peter chapter 3? Because there come a time when that ended. So look in your passage of Scripture, 1 Peter chapter 3. Just, uh, just one verse is all we're going to look at in this. Speaking of Christ here, we have Christ here mentioned in verse number 18, but then we get to verse 19, it says, By which also he, Christ, went and preached unto the spirits in prison. Okay. Now, let me tell you quickly what happened so, so we can move on here. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, okay, he, his body was buried, amen, put in the tomb, but his spirit was not there. His spirit left. And he went, he didn't go to hell. Y'all hear me? But he went to paradise. And from that point, he delivered, shall we say, the, the, the proclamation or the good news to the Old Testament saints that what? That all sin had been paid for it, but mainly the big deal was is that what? There was victory over death. Amen. Victory over death. And also in that point, he proclaims to the lost in hell and to the chained, we don't have time to go there, that's another lesson, to the chained demons that are in hell, he proclaimed his victory over it all. Yes, amen. And then as he was resurrected, he led captivity captive, and all of those in that compartment left and went to what we know now as heaven. Okay, so let's get back. Get back to Luke 16. It says here, verse 24, he says that he cried and said, this is, this is the rich man, Father Abraham, what does this tell us? First of all, if you, if you hold your spot and look back here, all right, look back here to the previous um, passages, Christ here is speaking to the Pharisees, okay? which means what? To religious people. Now hear me? He's speaking to religious people. Here by the rich man, we don't know a lot about him whatsoever. But when he makes the reference to Father Abraham, he's speaking of, it wasn't his literal father, he's speaking of, is that what? He is a, in a sense a beginning, but he's the father of the Jewish faith. To that degree. That's the reference there. So we know that he was a 
person. Now, I'm going to cut to the chase right here because the rapture might happen any second. I want to make sure I get this in. There will be a lot of religious people in hell. Amen. Let that sink in for a second. Because I'm fixing to build on that. In fact, virtually every single individual that will be in hell is a religious person. That's right. Because you see, there's only two. Now, y'all, hold on. Don't nobody run out. Don't shut the lights out. Just hold on. I'm talking about in people's mind, there are two ways to get to heaven. Hold on. One, we know that there's only one way. But to the lost, in their mind and in their heart, there's a second way. Doing good deeds, being the best I can, good things outweighing the bad. I've heard all this mess. I heard a new one here just a few weeks ago. In Super 1. <clears throat> you have conversations in the strangest places. Hey, listen to me. When brisket is on sale at Super 1, I'm checking it out. Y'all hear me? So there was this guy there, and he's from South Louisiana. I didn't mean to spend 41 minutes at the brisket counter. The only time I ever ever see some folks is, is, is Super Bowl. For 41 minutes, here's the conversation. He did 90, 40 minutes of the talk. Oh, you're a preacher. You know, people get real religious when they find out I'm a preacher, and I usually just don't even tell them. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to being in heaven. Looking forward to going to heaven. I just hope, listen to this, because he's telling me about this church that he helped out down in South Louisiana. Y'all hear me? Uh -huh. He's told me, he's, he's told me all the money that he gave to that church. He's told me about him taking his crew there to do, now he didn't, you know, to do all this work now. <coughs> All the stuff that he's given to that church, all the stuff, and all the ways that he's helped them do this, that, and other. Here's what he's saying. I just hope that when the time comes, God remembers all the things I've done for them. Mm. That ain't gonna make a big difference. But yet, many people today are trusting in those type things, trusting in work, trusting in their goodness, trusting in the fact that they're not as bad as the guy down the street, or they're not as bad as so-and-so, so God will certainly let them go. Christ here is speaking to the religious people, the Pharisees of that day. And I don't have the time to, 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 to go into to all of those things. Verse 24 says, And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send who? Amen. What does that tell you? That tells you, tells you that he knew Lazarus in his name all the time. I read the passage to you in Revelation chapter 22 here about three weeks ago. In, in, in the, the fact that as we talked about Agrippa, remembering throughout all of eternity as he's in hell, remembering all of his teaching, all of his Old Testament teaching, remember Agrippa was part Jew, remembering the, the gospel itself, remembering Paul, the apostle Paul, as he stood before him and sharing the gospel before all of them, and Agrippa's words to him was, we have it, uh, Again, I, I gave you the meaning of the term there, but literally it says, do you think in this little bit of time that you can actually talk me into being a Christian? And those words he will hear forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. That's right. Now, let me say something else. Let me tell you what keeps preachers up away from God. Say, well, what preachers? any preacher that's worth insane. And that's the fact that people that come under the sound of his preaching may spend eternity in hell. Can I tell you that what I just said about Agrippa 
will likely, I've been here some two and a half years now, but will also likely happen to some individual that's been in this church in the past two and a half years and possibly even today. We don't want to think about hell. We want to think, well, I just <clears throat> put that out of my mind. Well, it's still there. It's still there. And he cried, verse 24, and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, sin Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this place. We'll have him take the bulletin, the marker, whatever you can, and put it in this place because we'll, I'm going to read you some passages. And I didn't want to put on the screen because I want you to look at them in your Bible. Let's go to the book of Matthew. We'll be in Matthew for most of this time. But I'm going to read you some verses. Let's go to Matthew chapter 25. I'm just going to read through these. Matthew chapter 25, verse number 41. Again, if you look at your Bible, these words are in red. That's Jesus' word. It says, Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Matthew 25, 41. Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Verse 46 says, And these shall go away into everlasting punishment. Everlasting means forever, amen? amen. But the righteous, that means the saved, that means those God declares righteous, that's justification but the righteous into life eternal hell is forever still in Matthew but they're going back to chapter 13 Matthew chapter 13 verse number 42 And shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Matthew 22. Verse number 13. 22, 13 says, Then said the king of the servants, Bind him hand and foot and take him away and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Chapter 25. Matthew 25, verse number 30. Verse 30 says, And cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Luke chapter 13. <clears throat> Once again, all of these words of Christ. Luke 13, verse number 28, says, There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth when ye shall see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the prophets, prophets in the kingdom of God, and ye and you yourselves thrust out. You say, well, that's a little bit confusing. Well, that's really future tense. Because this is at the end of the millennial reign of Christ at the great white throne judgment. Again, giving, shall we say, evidence that the saints of God will be there, not in judgment, but behind the judge, watching 
as those are judged. If you don't want to know more about that, we'll hear next Sunday morning. Back to Luke 16. In verse number 24, Lazarus, excuse me, the rich man is calling upon Lazarus to come over and just dip his finger in the water and drip that drop on his tongue. He is in such torment and needs comfort. Verse 25 says, but Abraham says, son, remember another indication that he was a Jew. But Abraham says, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus, evil things, but now he is comforted and thou art tormented. And you might say, Well, isn't that proof that the rich go to hell and, 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 the, and, the, and, the, and the poverty is stricken to heaven? No. What it's talking about here is at the point there when he had all of his money, he didn't need anything else. That's right. He didn't need God for anything. He didn't want God butting in on his business. He ruled his world. He did his thing. He didn't need anything from God. Amen. I heard a story years ago about a son of a rich man. Rich man, his, his wife was saved. His son, he was getting on up, you know, in, in, in mid to upper 20s. Had, was doing well, this, that, and other. But respected his parents, and his parents kept taking him to having him, you know, come join us, we're going to go to church, we're going to revival, and all these other things, we're going to go hear this, we're going to do that. He wanted to say no, but he didn't. And of course, being lost, again, hearing the gospel, the Holy Spirit of God convicted his heart over and over and over and over. You see, realize that whenever the Holy Spirit of God convicts your heart, and you don't do what he wants you to do, it's because you're running from him. And he ran, and he ran, and he ran. And there come a point where that young man just simply, he cried out in the church service, folks. Listen to me. He cried out, God, I'm sick of it. Just leave me alone. Can I tell you what happened? God left him alone. You see, he crossed that line. And to his death, as reported by his parents, Never again. Because he never bothered one time. We come to a point here, and we've got some more to go here, but this, this introduces us. Jesus also said many times, he says, he that hath an ear, let it hear. And I'm talking about right now spiritually. Certainly, I've had conversations, close conversations with a number of people here. We've talked about their salvation. We've talked about this, but I've not talked with every single person here. I don't know about every single person here. Understand this. The Holy Spirit of God, if he convicts you of your sin, here's the thing today. And you say, well, preacher, you've asked this question over and over. But if you're here today and you're lost and you've not done anything about it, you need to understand, if you die today without Jesus Christ, you are going to hell. Doesn't matter if you like it or not. Doesn't matter if, well, you know, we just don't talk about that much anymore. And, no, it's your responsibility. It's not mama's and daddy's responsibility. It's not the preacher's responsibility. It's not your Sunday school teacher's responsibility. It's not Aunt Effie's responsibility. It's yours. You have to deal with this issue in your heart. You say, well, I prayed a prayer once upon a time. There'll be a lot of people in hell that pray the prayer once upon a time. So what are you saying, preacher? I'm saying that there are a lot of people that pray a prayer that, 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 that all of their hope is in a prayer, but there was never any change in them. Amen. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 17, it says, therefore, if, if, if any man be in Christ, he is a what? New creature. It's changed. It is impossible for an individual to get saved and stay the same. It's not possible. Here at this point, the lost man, the rich man, is suffering. Verse 26 says, and beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fit, a chasm that's impassable. He says, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot. Neither can they pass to us, pass to us that would come. In other words, you can't go back and forth. 
Verse 27 says, Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father. So at this point, he forgets thinking about himself, and he's thinking about his lost brethren. He says, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou would have sent him, Lazarus, to my father's house. For I have five brethren, literally five brothers, that he may testify unto. In other words, tell them about this situation. Tell them about this place called hell. Keep them from coming here. Amen. Lest they also come into this place of torment. Look what Abraham says. He says, they have Moses and the prophets. Those that God appointed. Now, so exactly what is he talking about? Does that mean that Moses is what? No, he's talking about the Old Testament. He's talking about the Old Testament. Let them hear them. In this, again, is something very important for us to understand. We certainly, as a child of God, we need to be prepared as we share the gospel of Jesus Christ with others. We need to be prepared. We need to read the Bible. We need to study. We need to pray. Okay. Can I tell you this? I think I'm right in this. In as long as you're here on this earth, there will always be, shall we say, Satan's attack as you share the gospel with somebody else. And what I'm talking about here is, is saying, you know what? You don't know it. Yep, Happens to me. Happens to every other preacher I know. Can I tell you this? You do your part, studying and praying. And that is God, again, puts that individual in your path. Can everyone just say it? I did not say that you just happened to cross paths by coincidence. No, what I said is, is that God puts that individual in your path and tells, puts your heart in the sense that you need to share with him, then you do what, you, what you're able to do through your obedience unto God and let God take it from that. Amen. But what we're seeing here is, is the power of the word of God in conviction. The power of the Word of God. We don't need signs. We don't need miracles. We don't need any of those things. We have the Word of God. Peter says we have a more sure word of prophecy. Let the Word of God do the work of God. Let the Holy Spirit of God work in that heart. And what Abraham is saying to him here is, is that they have in their possession, they have the Word of God. God in the Old Testament. Amen. That God will use. Then he goes on further. Has a double meaning, which we often see in Scripture. Verse 30 says, And he said, the rich man says, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they'll repent. There's an irony here that we'll get to in just a moment. Verse 31 says, And he said unto him, if they hear not, we're talking about spiritually, if they hear not Moses and the prophet, neither will they be persuaded. Though one rose from the dead. I said there's a double meaning. There's also another passage of scripture, I'm not going to go there this morning, but another passage of scripture, again, where there was someone that rose from the dead, Christ rose them from the dead, and his name also was Matthew. And when Lazarus then later appeared unto the religious, they tried to kill him. They didn't believe the one rose from the dead. Jesus Christ, the first fruits, again, as he was risen from the dead, later on appeared unto men, and many of those yet rejected him. Verse 100. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Don't want anybody looking around. Don't want you looking at your phone. I just need your attention for this one. I'm going to have you ask yourself a question. And 
I realized that for some, they heard me, they heard others over and over. But yet, I believe possibly that there's some that have not dealt with this question. Can you honestly say before you die that you know for sure that you belong to him? Not by being religious, not by being in church, not by putting money in the altar place, not by doing this, not by doing I'm talking about from the standpoint of some point in your life of you seeing yourself as God saw you and that's guilty as a sinner. And because of that, by faith, you looked to Jesus Christ who died on the cross for you personally, was crucified, <coughs> bled and died for you personally. Because that's the only way your sin could be paid for. That's what God the Father demanded. And by faith, you believe that he did that for you, that your sin was paid for. After that, you must ask the question, did I repent of my sin? Repentance more than just saying I'm sorry. And repentance again is it's with a heavy, hurting heart through conviction that we don't want to be like that anymore. We want to be made clean. Turning away. <coughs> Turning to Jesus Christ himself. Yes, and then asking God to forgive you of all your See, that's the only way God can do it. But he says, not only can he, but he promises that he will. He says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Can you, with absolute 100% certainty, say, well, Kyle, I know for sure. I know I, I've done this. Praise God, He lives within my heart. I know I'm saved. I know if I die right now, I'm going to heaven. But if you can't say that, in just a few moments, we're going to have a hymn in the country. Brother Bill's going to sing. And I'm going to ask you to come down in this aisle. Come to me. Let us talk about this thing. Let me open the word of God and show you what God says. Well, I've heard what you said. Well, yes, you have. But let's look at what God says. Father, right now, I pray, Lord, if there any lost here today, God, they not walk out that night. If you're here today and you know you're saved, but there's another reason for this message. Because I believe if you are saved, you know someone that's lost. And you need to understand, just as we saw in the lesson on this past Sunday night, speaking of God's will, God speaks and says it's important for us to redeem the time. In other words, make the best possible use of our time. And you need to understand the time's running out. And someone perhaps that you love here. Maybe just somebody that you work with, but whoever, but God's put them on your heart and they're very burdened. And you need to be praying, calling upon God for an opportunity. Time the clock is ticking. Your heart may be troubled this morning about something that has nothing to do with what I've said. But God brought you here. And he's spoken to your heart about something. And I'm just going to say to you, you can settle today. Father God, help us this day to do what you've brought us here to do. We just want to pray. Amen.